Hi, this is the States and Trusts online module about powers of appointment, and I am Professor Donna Byrne. Okay, the objectives for this segment are to use the correct terminology about powers of appointment, to distinguish between general and non-general powers, and then to explain the effect of exercising a power of appointment. This particular vid video is fairly general. The next one will track more closely with the materials in your casebook. Okay, first of all, note this has nothing to do with appointments. It's not power appointment setting. It's a power of appointment. The ability to say who gets what from a trust. Who gets the income or who gets the property. So here's some terminology. We talk about a donor and a donee, and we're, we're not actually talking about birthday presents, and we're not talking about giving blood. Um, the donor is the person who creates the power. Usually they've established a trust or transferred property to a trust. Not necessarily, um, but it's important to be clear that you're referring to the donor of the power as opposed to the donor of the underlying property. The donee is the person with the right to exercise the power. Notice that this person may not actually receive an interest in the trust. Sometimes we call the donor the creator of the power, and sometimes we call the donee the holder of the power. We'll see that come up again. Okay, the object of the power, a permissible appointee. Okay, now notice that this is kind of like a potential beneficiary, but it's only potential. And getting anything depends on donee actually exercising the power. Then there's usually a taker in default. That's the backup plan. The person who ent or entity who gets something if the donee does not actually exercise the power. So make sure you can use these terms. Donor of a power, donee, object of a power, and the taker in default. Okay, so now once a power of appointment exists, there's four things that can happen. Exercise, nothing, re release, or lapse. Exercise. The donee or holder of the power tells the trustee to distribute property to someone. Um, or the donee includes a clause in a will that exercises the power. Nothing. The donee never gets around to exercising the power or never wants to and the trustee just follows instructions in the trust. Now in a sense if the donee does nothing the donee has chosen the backup plan, the taker in default. Release. The donee may decide that he or she does not want to hold on to the power. Doesn't want doesn't want this 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 power, this authority. And in that case the donee can release the power. Sometimes we do this for tax purposes. Anyway, it's like giving the power back to the trust. It's also kind of like exercising the power by taking the property and then giving it back to the trust with no strings attached. Lapse. Now some powers kind of have a self-destruct feature. They can only be exercised by a certain date. So, you know, maybe by December 15th in writing or something. And if the power is not exercised, it lapses, disappears. What happens then? Well, the taker in default is going to get the property, right? It, essentially, it stays in the trust and it's going to go wherever the trust says. So let's see, um, lapse and release both end up in no more power and the donee has chosen the taker in default in both cases, right? It's kind of one of these deals where not to decide is to decide. Exercise means that the donee actively chooses someone, usually, well, other than the taker in default. Um, so lapse and release and exercise really are are not such different concepts. They're really kind of the same thing because in all cases the holder of the power has chosen someone, right? Either the taker in default or someone else. 
Okay, well, let's talk about exercise. Yeah, not, not this kind. Nix that. Um, so there's two ways to exercise a power of appointment. During life, that's an inter vivos power of appointment. Or in a will, a testamentary power of appointment can only be exercised in a will by referring to it in a clause in a will. Another way to divide up powers of appointment. A general power of appointment means the donee can appoint the property to self, creditors, donee's estate, or creditors of donee's estate. If you think about it, if the donee has a right to withdraw the property from the trust, right, and take it for yourself, that's a general power of appointment. Now, if donee could withdraw the property for self or could appoint it to his or her estate, that's a lot like owning the property. All right, and we've seen this before. When we looked at the elective share, we had a question about whether property that was subject to a general power of appointment should be included in the augmented estate. And in Bongards versus Millen, the court said no, but the, elect, the uh, Uniform Probate Court Code says yes. That's because having a general power of appointment is a lot like owning the property. And when you exercise the prop power, it's like taking the property for yourself and then making a brand new gift or transfer. If the donee can't take the property for self, creditors, estate, or creditors of estate, then it's not a general power. We just call it a non-general power. We used to make distinctions between special powers and limited powers. Not important. General versus non-general is what really matters here. Exercising a non-general power, where you can't take it for yourself, is kind of like filling in the blank for the donor. I leave my property to blank, to be filled in by so-and-so. Okay, so then you, it's like you're filling in that blank. Um, anyway, I'll go back to this a minute. All right, that's going to matter later. We're going to need to decide when a gift has been was made and so the kind of power of appointment and the timing that we attribute to it are going to matter for us. Okay, so think about all the different kinds. We can mix and match these. We could have a general inter vivos power of appointment. We could have a non-general inter vivos power, a general testamentary power, a non-general testamentary power, an inter vivos and testamentary general power of appointment, or an inter vivos and testamentary non-general power of appointment. Okay, so we need to specify how the donee of the power can exercise it, right, inter vivos or testamentary, and we need to specify who it can be appointed to. Okay, so review. Exercising a general power of appointment is like taking the property and making a new transfer. Exercising a non-general power is like filling in the blank for the donor. And it matters because we will need to know when an interest in property is created. For tax purposes, a holder of a general power of appointment is treated like an owner for tax purposes. Any property subject to that power is included in the gross estate. Okay, and then I mentioned Bongard versus Millen a minute ago with the elective share. Um, in Bongard versus Millen, the court did not allow the elective share to reach property subject to a general power of appointment, but the Uniform Probate Code does. The U UPC elective share and the federal estate tax um, kind of are consistent this way. We're pretending you own the property. That means creditors can get to it as well. Okay, so here's a practice problem. Libby's will, I'll go away here. Libby's will gave property and trust to First Bank with income to George for life, remainder to those persons among whom my descendants, among my descendants to whom George appoints by will, and to the extent that George does not so appoint, then to Lori. Okay, so we need to identify the donor, donee, taker in default, Decide whether this is inter vivos or testamentary, and decide whether it's general or non-general. Okay, so the donor is Libby, the donee is George, 
All right, she created the power. He's the one who holds the power. And the taker in default is Lori. So if George doesn't appoint, it goes to Lori. Do I fit here? Eh, pretty well. Okay, that, that part should be easy and clear. Inter vivos or testamentary? All right, it says he has to appoint by will, so it's testamentary. General or non-general? Well, he can only appoint among my descendants. That's Libby's descendants. So that looks non-general, but wait. Are Libby and George related? Is he one of those descendants? Because if he is, that makes this a general power of appointment. Okay, so what have we seen? A power of appointment is a right to say who will get something. And sometimes the creator is called the donor. Sometimes the holder, hold, holder. The holder is called the donee. If the holder can appoint to self, creditor's estate, or creditors of the estate, any one of those, the power is a general power. Otherwise, it's a non-general power. And general powers are treated a lot like ownership, especially for tax and the elective share. Exercising a general power is like taking the property, making a new transfer. And exercising a non-general power is like filling in the blank for the original transferor. Okay. okay, the next thing we'll talk about will be Beals versus State Street Bank and Trust, but that will be in the second half of this um, materials, the next video. Um, the trust uh, goes back to Arthur Honeywell, who, according to the Harvard Law School, or not Harvard Law School, Harvard College, whatever it was then, um, class newsletter or something, said, as a student, he did not aim for or attain noticeable rank. So find out more about Arthur Honeywell in the next video. Thank you for watching.